What does it take? And the book of James really focuses on the second. It is a how-to book for Christians. Uh, somebody once I heard describe it as a, uh, <clears throat> one of the dummies series, you know, the dummies book on computers or Microsoft or whatever. Uh, this is kind of a dummies book on sanctification. Uh, and I fit that category very well. I, I need all the help I can get. Uh, in my opinion, it is the best, if not one of the best, how-to books ever written. And before the internet, uh, some of you know, is we used to have how-to books, how to fix your car, how to repair the house, whatever. Uh, but this, this is a how-to book that we really need to, to pay attention to. So before we get into the rest of the study with that introduction, let's go ahead and open with a time of prayer. Lord, we come to you tonight. We humbly ask your blessings upon us. We ask that you would share your wisdom through your book of James, the how-to book for those of us who are walking with you. It's not written necessarily for the unchristian. It's really written for us, the Christians, who have already accepted you as Lord and Savior. And we pray that you'd guide us through this book, that we would learn more about you. Give us wisdom tonight, open our ears, open our hearts, and let us worship you. In this we pray, amen. Uh, when you accept the Lord as your Savior, when you're first born again into the family of God, this is a beginning. This is a time when you're starting a new life, a new way, and as newborn babies, uh, we begin with baby steps. We're new in the faith. We're new in the in knowledge. We're new in this, this whole thing called Christianity. Uh, before this time, we may have been antagonistic towards it. But for some reason, the Lord has gotten a hold of our hearts. Finally, we've given in and we've given our heart to him. I'll figure this out eventually. <laughs> Takes me a minute. 1 Peter 2.2 2 describes it. It says, As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And as newborn babies in Christ, we are to desire the word. But as babies in this world, we're not really designed to stay babies. We're designed to grow and so in Hebrews 5, 12, it says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, he's, teaching, he's talking to some of the more mature Christians, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not... Wow, Okay. <clears throat> and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And so for those of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior, we start out as babes, and we need to learn more about the Lord and more about this journey that we're on. And I was talking, to, when, I, when I taught on Hebrews, we, we likened it to a race. And it was a race that was set before us. But tonight we're going to be looking at it more as a growth, more as a maturity, more as the, the growing up in the Lord, if you will. And so spiritual growth is one of the main themes of this book. Spiritual growth, also called sanctification. And there are four main points through the book of James that he talks about when it comes to spiritual growth. The first thing to understand is that spiritual growth should be a given. It's the normal. It's the standard. When you become a Christian, you should be growing in the Lord. When you're a baby, you should be growing up and becoming older and more mature. It is only when there is a lack of growth, a lack of movement, a lack of spiritual maturity, that it really becomes a problem. And so if you're growing in the Lord, that's a good thing. That's what we should be doing. If you're not growing in the Lord, or if you haven't been growing in the Lord, you need to step back and ask yourself, why? What's been going on? 
Why are you not growing in the Lord? Why are you stagnant? Why? And understand that the Lord does not want you to stay where you are. He wants you to grow. He wants you to gain wisdom. He wants you to gain maturity. Not so that you can become a smart guy, a smart girl, but so that you can be more effective for the, for the kingdom. Wisdom is not always intellect. Wisdom is the ability to use what the Lord has given us. The second point of these four points I want to talk about from James is spiritual growth is a progression and a constant progress. It's not something that you just do once. You don't just become a Christian and then grow up and you are a Christian and you stay there. You don't stagnate. Uh, it's a process. And in 1 John, it talks about we begin as little children. He talks to them as little children. And then they progress to young men. He's talking about the young men in the church. And then he talks about the fathers. And, you know, in, in this day and age, we could talk about the, the young women or the mothers. In that culture, they mainly talk to the men. But we don't stay where we are. We continue. <clears throat> Now, there may be starts and there may be stops. Um, those of you who've raised teenagers know that they will be one, one height one day and you'll turn around and all of a sudden their pants are two or three inches too short because they've had a growth spurt. And that can happen in our spiritual walk as well. We can have growth spurts where suddenly something clicks and we just really grow. And other times, it's not quite so fast and not quite so no noticeable. The third point is that spiritual growth has nothing to do with your, spiritual, or with your physical growth. Just getting older in age does not make you any more spiritual in your walk with God. Old age is not nat necessarily a, con you know, a part of the, the process. We would hope that it is. But there are some that don't even come to know Christ until they're in their 50s. There's some that don't even know to come, no, easy for me to say, don't even know, come to know Christ until they're in their late 60s or 70s or even 80s. And we've got people in this church who have come to Christ late in life. And so they may be 60 or 70 years old, but they have just been born into the kingdom. They're just born into the family. But man, it's amazing how fast they grow. At that point, they seem to be longing for the word, and they really dive in oftentimes. And so even sometimes the older folks among us still need the milk of the word. 1 Corinthians 3.2 3, says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able even though they were growing older, they were not growing wiser, they were not growing in their spiritual walk. And so that is something that the Lord really wants for us. And the fourth item, if we go through the entire book of James, you'll find that God has given us everything we need to grow. There is nothing that is lacking. God has provided us everything. 2 Peter 1.3, as his divine power has given to us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. God has given us everything we need. He has given us all things. And it's only upon us to dive into his word, to learn more about him, to spend more time with him on a daily basis to get to know him better. Basically, he put the ball in our court. As we study the book of James, we will see some of the practical methods that allow us to live what we know to be the truth. We will get some guidance, some of the wisdom for dummies, if you will, 
that will give us some insight into what we need to do. So, for those of you who have your Bibles, we'll be studying the book of James. We'll be starting in chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verses 1 through 4. And so the book of James is written by James. Obviously, it's a brilliant deduction on my part. Uh, It's titled James, and it starts out James. It says James. But who was James? We have many James in the New Testament that we come across. Uh, There was James, who was the brother of John. These are the sons of Zebedee. We have James, the son of Alphaeus, who was mentioned. And we have James, who is the father of the apostle Judas, but not Judas Iscariot, the other James. But the James that wrote this book is not any of those. This James is actually the half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus as his big brother. That could be a daunting task. I had a big brother. We got along great. My little brother, we didn't get along so well. But a big brother can be a big part of your life, but he can also be a problem. James lived in the same house. He lived in, he walked the same streets. He saw him day in and day out. You know, those could have been quite the credentials. He could have started this off by saying, James, the brother of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But he didn't. He could have said, I knew Jesus when he was this tall. But he didn't. He could have boasted with pride, and he could have pumped himself up, but he didn't. He introduced himself as James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a man who had a lot of potential credentials, but he didn't use those. So why the humble greeting? Why did he enter it so humbly? You know, one of the things we must remember about James and the other brothers of Christ is that they didn't really believe him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it says, after that he was seen by over... Well, let's see, I jumped the... Yeah, I got something out of, out of line here. Uh, so... It was in John 5, 7, John chapter 7, verse 5, where we're told that even his brothers did not believe in him. The the guys who grew up with Jesus watched him, his family watched him as he became more and more prominent, and they didn't believe who he was. So what changed? What changed in James that he went from not believing in Jesus as the Lord to believing Jesus as Lord? And we find that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. It says, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, this is after the resurrection, of whom the greater part remained to the present. So they're still around. If you want to go talk to these 500, you can find most of them. But some of them have fallen asleep. Some of them have passed on. But after he talked to the 500, after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. We don't know what changed the perspective of James from being a non-believer to being James, the bondservant of of Christ. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened during this visitation where Jesus went and talked to James. We don't have a report. We don't have that written down. We don't know what was said. But we can only imagine 
We've seen our brother walk around the countryside claiming all these miraculous things, performing all these miracles. We scoffed at him, we scoffed at him. We see our brother hung on a cross. And being hung on a cross was not a, a good thing to be known for. That was for the criminals, for the bad people. My brother was hung on a cross. That's not something you want to brag about. But after he was hung on the cross, he was seen again, and he was alive. My brother is alive. What kind of impact would that have? I didn't believe you before. Now it all makes sense. We can only imagine that Jesus went to him and said, Brother, this is who I am. And it changed his perspective. He went from unbelief to belief. Not only that, but James became the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. He didn't just become a believer, he became a leader. And remember, this was a time of persecution. Being a follower of Christ was not an easy thing to be. If you were Jewish and a Christian, your Jewish family often disowned you. You became basically the enemy of the Jews. You were not part of them. The Romans didn't like you any better because you were part of this uh, revolutionary sect that was out to change the world. Uh, they, you know, he said, I am the Messiah. And the Messiah was expected to come back and take over from the Romans. He, they, they, everybody expected him to ascend the throne at that point. And so the Romans saw him as rebels. And so James went from unbelief to belief. But this leader of the Christian church at that time, who better than he to tell us how to grow in the spirit? Who better than James, the brother of Jesus, to tell us how to walk in the spirit, how to grow in the spirit, how to become more like Jesus, somebody who knew him as well as anybody else in the world? Who better than one who had become the spiritual giant? So we start with the verse one. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James, a bondservant of the Lord. The Greek word for bondservant is doulos. This was someone that has made a voluntary decision. It's usually been somebody who was a slave. They were sold into slavery or they sold themselves into slavery. But they've decided that their master is such a good master that they want to stay with him. It's a conscious decision. It's not something that's forced upon them. It's not something that they have to do. But they've decided their master is somebody that they want to follow. And so the bond servant he has become he did that willingly. He did it voluntarily. And even more amazing, he calls his brother Lord. And the way the, that sentence is constructed, the bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, when he puts it in that order, he is putting the Lord Jesus Christ on an equal footing with God the Father. He recognized the deity of Jesus Christ. He was recognizing who he was and what was deserving of him. What a transformation. Can you just imagine going from the one side to the other? Such a change. So we have James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, writing a letter to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. That's verse, the rest of the verse. Greetings. So the phrase, the 12 tribes was a reference to the nation of Israel. You know, many times throughout the Old Testament, they talk about the 12 tribes, and, and they're named repeatedly. But by this time in the Jewish history, that heritage has kind of gotten blurred. The genealogies had gotten a little bit stretched, a little thin. Many of them were lost. Many could not tell what tribe they were originally, originally from. Many of the uh, priests 
that lineage was very uh, well kept, so many of the priests were able to know their lineage. But overall, many of them didn't know who it was. So the 12 tribes referred more to the Jewish nation, to the Jews as a whole. It, it was kind of a euphemism for that. And so the Jewish people at this time had been scattered. The persecution was pretty tough. We talked about that. Uh, both the Romans and the Christians. And you may remember Paul, or Saul at the time, who became Paul, the apostle. In Acts 8.1 it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, referring to Stephen. At that time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stayed there, but the rest of the Jews were scattered. The rest of the Christian Jews were scattered because the Jews, the Romans, were persecuting them. And so the Christians at that time were found out throughout the known world. They went everywhere. They ended up in all different places. The Jewish people had been scattered, and then the Jewish Christians had been scattered, and then many of the Gentiles were becoming Christians. And so... There was a lot of people, a lot of Christians throughout the world. And they needed instructions on holiness and sanctification. Because this was a new concept to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And as a result, the tenets that we find in this book are applicable to all of us today. Both Jew and Gentile, because we have all become part of the scattered group. So, we've got the, the brother of Christ, the bondservant of God, writing this book to the Christians that are scattered throughout the world. And then James writes, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, the group of people he's writing to have been scattered through persecution. And he doesn't say if you fall into trials, but when. And he could probably almost say that since you have been fallen into trials. The word fall in the Greek is translated as, and, and, and I've got it written down what they say, but I can't pronounce it. So uh, all the, old, the, the New Testament is Greek to me. But it's translated as to fall into something that is all around that is to light upon or among, be surrounded with, to fall among or into. That's like falling into the water. You're, you're surrounded by it. The word that he used recognizes that the trials were already around them at that time. And trials are already around us in this world that we live in. And the phrase to fall into was not a slow process, but it was a sudden falling. It is as if you're plunged into the trials that are all around you, and there's no escaping them. You fall into it, you're plunged into it, you're immersed in it. It's almost a sink or swim. You fall, and you either sink or you swim. The word trials in verse 2, the Greek word, is described as a putting to proof by experiment, experience, solicitation, Discipline or provocation, by implication, by adversity, by temptation. Trials weren't necessarily a discipline. They weren't a punishment. It, it was more like the school test when you were in school and you took a test to see how much you'd learned that semester. It was a test to see where you were. If you were on a sports team, you might have tryouts to, to make the, the basketball team or the football team. It's to see how you compared to the standards that were set there. And so it, it, it was really checking to see where we are. It's kind of wondering when the trials come our way, how do we respond? Do we get angry? Do we complain? What's our response to the trials that come before us? 
And it says that there were the various trials, various, the Greek word means motley, that is various in character, manifold, different hues or colors. They're different. Sometimes the differences are subtle. Sometimes they're greater. Um, but each one is different. We are all different here in this room, and so our trials are all going to be different. Mine aren't yours. Yours aren't mine. And even then, all of my trials aren't the same trial. At one period of time, I might be going through a set of trials, and the next time I go through a set of trials, it can be completely different. I would hope that that's partly because I learned <laughs> through the first trial. Sometimes I'm a slow learner. He may have to take me through it twice, but I, I hope that I learned the first time. Sometimes we can watch when others go through a trial. I had an older brother who was always getting in trouble. And I'd sit back and go, uh-huh, I'm not going to do that when I get there. I learned from his mistakes, but sometimes I had to make my own. Each of us has different strengths and different weaknesses. Therefore, we each have different trials. Now, the trials that we fall into come into three main categories. They're physical trials, they're mental or emotional trials, and they're spiritual trials. There are those in this room, as a result of sickness, have physical imperities, uh, impairments. There are those that something has happened, uh, and, and they're, they're not able to move like they used to. They move like they want to. Sometimes it's a medical issue. There's those that have been in accidents, car accidents, motorcycle accidents, surfing accidents, uh, that cause them to have injuries that change the way they move or the way they walk or what they can do. We have people in this church that suffer from chronic pain. You never know it. Many of them, unless you know their story, you don't realize that they're in pain most of the time because they've learned that they can get through it with Jesus. They trust in the Lord and he strengthens them. He doesn't take the pain away. Sometimes he does, but he doesn't always. And so they live in pain. We have some in this church going through emotional trials. Sometimes these are trials we bring upon ourselves, and sometimes they're trials that are put upon us by others. People don't always treat us the way we want to be treated. We, it's not fair, but we, we deserve to be treated better. And some trials may encompass more than one type. It may be emo emotional and physical, or it may be emotional and spiritual. <laughs> that, that works for me because these lights are so bright it's hard for me to see, so that kind of helps when they go down. But. <laughs> spiritual trials. These take a variety of forms, but for me, the spiritual trial that I fight the most is a lack of faith. Did God really say what he said? Did God really do what he did? Uh, the world that we live in is always telling us, you Christians are foolish. That's crazy. We know evolution happened. He didn't create the world. And so the world we live in is always pushing us to understand that we're following a myth or make-believe. And these are true trials. They're trials of faith. And we... Many of us have suffered through them at different times. But we're in good company. Those of you who have suffered a lack of faith, you know, John the Baptist was called the greatest prophet ever by, the Je by Jesus Christ. The greatest prophet ever. He was the last prophet of the Old Testament. Yet he had his doubts. Even John the Baptist who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River and said, I'm not worthy of tying the sandals on your feet. He questioned Jesus. We see in Matthew 11, 1, it says, Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John, this being John the Baptist, 
had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Are you the Christ that we're waiting for? Are you who I baptized in the Jordan River who said I'm unworthy, the one who the skies opened and God said, this is my son whom I, in whom I am well pleased. Are you really the Christ? John the Baptist was fully aware of the miracles that Jesus had done. He had walked in with him. He had seen him. He had been there. He had heard the voice of God. And yet, John the Baptist says, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? So if you suffer from trials, a lack of faith, understand that we're in good company. Trials will come. They're all around us, and we may suddenly be plunged into them. So how then are we to respond to trials? James tells us to count it all joy. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, count it all joy when the world is falling in on you. Count it all joy when your world is falling apart. That's tough. What does he mean by that? Well, let's look at some of the meanings of these words. The Greek word for count means to lead, that is command with official authority. Figuratively to deem, that is to consider, be chief, to esteem, governor, judge, have the rule over, suppose, think. To take control, to count it as joy. To count it means to lead it, to hold on to it. And the Greek word for joy means cheerfulness. That is calm, delight, gladness. Be exceedingly joyful or joyous. Count it all joy. This is not to mean that we're to count the pain or the sorrow itself as joy. We're not to be joyful about the pain itself. But we are to count it joy that the Lord is using this trial to test us, to judge us, not in a judicial sense, but to, to gauge where we are in our walk. He may be using these trials to sand off some of the rough edges on us or to change our course. He's using these trials so that we might become more like him. We might grow in our walk with him. And so we are to rejoice in him during these trials. A couple passages from Philippians 3. One says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Not in the trial, but in the Lord. And Philippians 4.4 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. The Lord is with us during the midst of these trials. He is with us in the midst of this pain. And he is using these trials. Whether these trials are self-inflicted because we made stupid mistakes. Whether there's something that we've done that we knew we shouldn't have done. Whether we've made choices that, you know, were bad choices. Or whether they're trials that the Lord has put upon us to gauge where we are. We are to rejoice in him. And we can only rejoice when we are in him. So, verse 3 and 4. No, oh, I don't have those up there. Verse 3 and 4 of chapter 1 says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So, we are to rejoice in the midst of our trials, because we know that the testing of our faith is going to produce patience. Now notice with me that the trials do not produce your faith. Your faith is not necessarily a result of the trial, but it's a result, the trials are to test your faith to see where you are. So if the trials don't produce the faith, what does produce our faith? How do we grow our faith. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
A side note, I heard one time that there was a group of men, theologians, who thought that the deaf could never come to know Christ because faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God and the deaf couldn't hear. That's not what this means. Faith comes by the word of God and we can hear it spoken or we can read it. Faith comes to us supernaturally as we read the Bible, as we hear God's word spoken, as we understand what God is trying to tell us, and as we trust the word of God. Just reading the word of God does us no good if we don't trust it. But the more time we spend in the word, the more time we spend with God, the stronger our faith will be. The more time we spend alone with God listening to that still, small voice, the more we can hear him. And there's those that said that God speaks to us during our good times in the still, small voice, but he shouts to us during our trials. And as we're going through our trials, God is saying, come to me, trust in me, walk with me. God is always stronger than our trials. Remember, trials are never pleasant. That's why they're called trials. Uh, But after we have endured, after the pain is gone, we can look back and see God's presence with us. The more trials we endure, the more faith that we have that God will be with us during the next one. You know, I look back on my life and I see some of the times when things were really tough and I didn't understand. But I look back now and I can tell you God was there. God spoke to me through that action. At that time, God spoke to me in a way that I never would have believed possible. And God has blessed me now as as a result of walking through those trials. The Remember that the trials are a form of testing, not as in judgment, but as in evaluation. They're not to knock us down, but to evaluate us in our walk with Christ. They're the litmus test of where we are and what needs to be changed in our life. And as we walk through these trials, the more we become uh, dependent upon him, the more our faith will be stronger the faith that produces the patience and will move forward. Patience, that's a a, a strange word that they use. Uh, Some of the translations, your Bible may have it translated as steadfastness. Uh, The Greek word means cheerful or hopeful endurance, constancy, enduring, patient, patient waiting, continuance. Cheerful or hopeful endurance. Uh, That's an interesting group of words. Uh, It's not a passive action. It's not just like waiting there. When's it going to be done? When's he going to be finished? Uh, It's more that you're able to endure. This type of patience has the character of someone who not only can endure, but chooses to endure. You may have the ability to avoid the trial or to escape the trial. You may be able to get out of the trial, but you don't. You stay in the trial and you endure and you walk through it. You choose to remain and you benefit as a result. Why do we endure? James tells us that we know. He said that you may... knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, knowing that the testing of your faith. And this word, know, is a very strong word. It's more like you know because you know because you know it because you know. He's making it very, very emphatic. It's a very strong statement. And there is a benefit to the waiting. And what is this benefit? That this steadfastness, this enduring, this waiting, this patience will have a perfect or complete work in us. This patience will have its full effect. It will be complete 
and it'll have a complete result in your life. I'd sure hate to go through the pain and bail out before I'm fully benefiting from it. Getting out before the race is complete. Bailing before you're done. The trials in our life are used for our good. Some, remember, are the results of our own bad decisions and others are designed by God to help us to be sanctified, to become more like Him. And during these trials, we're never abandoned to our own devices. He's always there with us. We do not need to rely on our own strength. He is there. Romans 8, 27 tells us, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purposes. That doesn't mean all things are good. That doesn't mean all trials are pleasant. That means he uses these trials for our good that we might become more perfect. And the word perfect doesn't mean without error. It means more complete, more finished. Hebrews 12, 7, if you endure chastening, that's a form of trial, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? And Hebrews 12, 11 says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. These trials, this chastening, these tests are a form of training to help us to become more like Jesus, more like him, to become closer to who he wants us to be. First Peter 4.19, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So sometimes we suffer according to the will of God. Proverbs 2.6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. They're being tested. They're going through a trial. And during those 40 years, they were giving many miraculous signs that would cause them to have hope. And God was with them day and night those 40 years. The psalmist in Psalm 26, 2 says, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. He desired to be tested by the Lord to know where he was. And I want to close with this verse, Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Remember that when we're going through trials, it's not easy. It's not always pleasant. We don't always understand why we're going through the trial. We very seldom choose to go through the trials. But God is with us. He understands what you're going through. He understands your pain like no one else can. And remember, we have the Lord on our side He is with us and will be with us to the end. And once we've finished this trial, we can then share our faith and our experiences with others that are going through these trials so that they don't have to go through the trial alone. And the trials may not be for your benefit, although you will benefit by the trial, but that trial may be preparing you to be a benefit to somebody else. You may be able after your trial to walk with somebody
to carry them, to show them the way that they need to go to walk with Jesus. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you, and we praise you for this night. We thank you for the wisdom that you put in the book of James. We thank you that your brother, your half-brother, gave us these words. We just pray that we would take this message to heart, that you would speak to each one of us and show us what you have in store for us and how that we can better walk with you. Help us to be sanctified to your image and to your glory, we pray. Amen.